Hello everyone and welcome to this winter semester's second online lecture in English, which is part of the University of Oldenburg's Department for History's lecture series on games and history. My name is uh, Lukas Hases. I am postdoctoral researcher, often lecturer on early modern history at the University of Oldenburg in Germany and a member of the working group Historical Science and Digital Games and I'm the host of this online lecture series. This semester at the University of Oldenburg, I'm giving an introductory lecture on the early modern period and teaching a course on video games and history, of which this lecture series is part of. One of the lecture series biggest advantages is that it brings together renowned scholars and international early career research with master students and bachelor students and interested members of the public working with historical games in order to discuss these together in a rather casual evening atmosphere uh, for an hour. Today's speaker is Angus A. A. Mohl from Leiden University, whose work I've been following for more than two years now. And I have to say that I'm not only highly intrigued uh, by the participatory and open nature of your work, but also by your interdisciplinary teamwork. And we will see a lot of that, uh, as I've just given a glimpse, and the cooperative fashion of how you work with your students and also pupils. So Angus, it is truly an honor as well as a great pleasure to have you here doing this lecture series. Before Angus begins with this lecture, however, I'd first like to properly introduce him to you, uh, today's audience. Angus I.A. Mole is Assistant Professor at Leiden University Center for Digital Humanities. Before studying the intersection of the past and play, Angus was an archaeologist who specialized on the culturally diverse and indigenous and colonial Caribbean, conducted network analyses and worked on material culture. He was also postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University's Department of Anthropology, as well as the Digital Strategy Coordinator of the Prince Claus Fund for Culture and Development. Angus now teaches Digital Humanities and Game Studies courses at Leiden University, together with Aris Politopoulos and Sibylle Lames, and is currently finishing up the Super Duper Past and Play project, which represents an experimental play space in which interested people can join the researchers and students from Leiden University to play with them while learning about the past and how we relate to it in the present. Furthermore, Angus will soon start working on a new research project called Playful Time Machines, which he will be telling us more about today. On top of that, Angus is also co-founder and an active member of VALUE, an interdisciplinary collective of archaeologists, historians, museologists and game designers who have made it their mission to share our knowledge and appreciation of the past through playful outreach projects such as Raw Minecraft and Streaming the Past on Twitch. I will share all the links to these with you via the chat in a minute. The paper he will be presenting today, which I'm really looking forward to, focuses on his brand new NRO funded project and is titled Playful Time Machines, the design experience and values of the past in video games. Thank you, Angus, for sharing your time with us and the stage is now yours. It's entirely my pleasure uh, to be uh, uh, invited to this, uh, I would say, August lecture series. You've already uh, uh, experienced uh, quite a few uh, top-notch uh, minds in this uh, absolutely fascinating field that uh, is at the intersections of the past and video games. And I'm very happy to be uh, to be uh, among uh, those people that gets to share that with you. And I also have the benefit of uh, maybe, uh, you know, building on what people have already been discussing and also doing some other uh, bit more conceptual, funky kind of things with you in terms of uh, how to actually think about how we experience the past through video games. Um, and that's... In that sense, that's also part of the premiere that you'll be getting. Uh, uh, this is every, in fact, the, um, I guess this is the very first time that uh, I present publicly about the Playful Time Machines project uh, because it hasn't started yet. So that's always an easy uh, way out as well. So if ever, if something changes in this project, which you will see later, that's simply because right now I just have dreams about it still. Dreams that will come hopefully in many ways in fulfillment, but it hasn't started yet. It's just building on what I've been doing in the past. Uh, but uh, the conceptual framework for it, I'm and also a bit of the methodological framework I'll definitely share, building also on case studies that I've been working with before. So let me see, I want to make sure that I there is some motion and video in there. So I think this will is the way that things will be all right. Yes, for sure. You should be able to see um, the slides now. So as already said, um, I'm going to talk about Playful Time Machines, my uh, my new project coming up, which is a research group project. I also shall talk a little bit about that later. And it really is a project that tries to connect um, this uh, the sort of the different uh, components of thinking about past play. At least that's way, the way I conceptualize it. So the design experience and value driven components of past play. When I say past play, I you can also think of 
uh, how we play with the past in video games, but sometimes um, it's also a little bit more loose. Past play can also take place in all sorts of different settings. Here, I will mostly stick to video games, or in fact, fully, I think, stick to video games. So, um, the structure of this talk is I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the impact of past, past play, then uh, I'll talk about magic circles, time machines, and experiential artifacts. This is where it gets a little bit conceptually funky, maybe. Uh, and then I'll uh, stick to um, uh, the more uh, solid ground uh, of the methodology, so how to study past play experiences, how will we study that in this particular project, based on what we've already done uh, before me and other members of the Value Foundation and our people that I've been working with, including Sibyl Lammers at Line University. So I'll um, talk you through um, how I, for example, use a, a method called autoethnography or a set of methodologies, I guess, called autoethnography in the context of all Minecraft, for example. And I also talk about the possibilities of distant reading. So that's computer assistant a reading of large scale paratexts of large scale texts having to do with games uh, in the context of the battlefield game. And that will hopefully lead to the start of some of the answers. And, and if I don't get too excited, we even have some time for Q&A as well at the end. All right, let's go. Obviously, um, I don't have to point out to uh, all of you here that in video games, the past is present. Right now, while I'm talking, there are people doing, well, maybe for them, much more interesting things. 50,000 people right now are playing Sid Meier Civilization 5, uh, well, 5 and 6 uh, combined, right? And maybe there's some stragglers also still playing Sid Meier Civilization 4, 3, etc. Um, right now as well, a, Vi a, a Viking raid is taking place on an English monastery, right? Uh, in the newest Assassin's Creed Valhalla game. Or uh, other stragglers are also still uh, rummaging around in the deserts of Egypt because this is an immensely popular uh, video game that has sold more than 155 million copies. Probably by now, this is already from last year. Probably now by now, already upwards of 160 million copies. And of course, something I also be talking about: shooter games, for example, the Battlefield series is played for millions of hours of each week, immersing people. Uh, for better or worse, in uh, the battlefields of the 20th century, as well as, of course, contemporary and future battlefields as well. And we know from research that uh, I've uh, carried out as part of the Value Foundation that, and also from other similar types of research, that these experiences that we're having in video games are, in fact, pretty impactful. So for example, when we ask the following questions, can do you believe that or do you agree with the statement that video games can change someone's viewpoint on a historical event in a survey from July 2020? 90% um, of players at least somewhat agreed and many strongly agreed with this particular statement, right? That also to me indicates that probably they've had this happen or they know of something It's not just some sort of theoretical changing of viewpoints, right? So these things that we're doing in games is actually changing how we view the past. At the same time, we also know that if you're in touch with especially um, the more traditional uh, AAA uh, large scale entertainment industry that is video games, that uh, this particular part of it is not always embraced, right? So for example, you will have somebody like Sid Meier, the Sid of Sid Meier civilization saying that one of her fundamental goals in developing civilization was not to project her own philosophy or politics onto things. Playing out somebody else's political philosophy is not fun for the player. So you have this designer of a game that, for example, between 2010 and 2016 was played for 1.2 billion hours collectively for humanity, the same amount of hours as we spend in the big six, six biggest museums of the world saying, we just developed something that didn't really have any political philosophy or thought behind it. Same thing goes at least for uh, previous iterations of uh, the Assassin's Creed games, where you will have somebody like uh, Alf Condelius, the previous COO of Ubisoft, saying that people like to put politics into their games and that they back away from those, uh, Ubisoft backs away from those interpretations as much as possible uh, because they don't want to take a stance in current politics because that's bad for business. So yeah, at the same time, you have this very impactful thing. Same time, you also have this, well, we're hands off here. Uh, to me, that's, um, it's, it's one level, it's concerning, but another level, it's also very fascinating because it does show to me that something very interesting is going on. And especially it's not something that you'd have to uh, sort of even, um, look in the, at the current moment for, right? The very start of game studies, uh, 
arising from the work of a historian, Johan Huizinga, the very first page comes out and says, for many years, the conviction has grown upon me that civilization, I mean, here it's an old fashioned word, not about the actual game, but an old fashioned word for culture, basically, that civilization arises and unfolds in and as play. And that basically means that um, for housing, at least, and I think for many people that followed uh, in his conceptual footsteps, that what we're doing in games actually um, underpins culture. And at the same time, of course, we're actually practicing culture and we're, we're doing culture in games as well. And together with that very important statement of understanding the, um, the actual impacts of, of the way we play, right? Huizinga actually doesn't talk about video games in 1938, but um, I don't think he could have foreseen the impact that play would actually have in this current ludic century. Together with that, you have this idea, of course, that is often quoted, especially in game design studies. It's you probably cannot take a game design course without bumping in this into this particular concept of the magic playground, right? Often explained through this particular graph over here. Um, if you kick a ball into a net in the real world, you're just kicking a ball into a net. And if you do that in a playground or a pitch, you're actually scoring a goal. It's a, a very often seen graph. And if you think about what would that look like if you think about past play, about how we play with the past in video games. So you have this magic time machine almost, if you want to think about it. It's rule-based and it's mimetic, so it does take parts and it does look like the worlds that we know. At the same time, if you follow Huizinga's thinking about this, this particular magic circle is free and immaterial, right? It's not supposed to be uh, what you do in that magic time machine is not supposed to give you any sort of material gains. There's not something you're going to take away from it. This is Huizinga talking, right? We'll make things a bit more complex later. And I think this is a very important one. This magic circle is spatio-temporally set aside, right? It is not actually part of business or history or the world as usual. So in the real present world, right, if you're dressed like an 80s rock star, you scream, you're brandishing a battle axe, and well, probably what's going to happen is you're going to get the police called on you, right? But of course, if you're doing that in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, then you're within that magic circle. This is Huizinga's conceptualization of this. You're living your best Viking life. This is what is happening when you're past playing. Of course, I think we all know, because this is basically theory that's almost 100 years old now, that things are much more complex if you look at the magic circle, because the magic circle isn't all that... Um, uh, well, it's not all that nicely round and it's not all that contained. There are, for example, a lot of things that are drawn into play that maybe are not exactly part of that particular game, but they are drawn into it. So this material interest and sort of the free part of it is not exactly something that most game study scholars will hold to. There are, of course, things that are playful, that are technically speaking not part of the game, of the magic circle. There are things that are simply not play, right, that are put outside of the game. And there's, of course, also things that are actively kept out of play. For example, real Viking axes, real quote-unquote, right? Or the Lindisfarne ruins, or a Drakkar, right? This, this much more current uh, mythology of the, the Viking ship. Or the author, uh, or the, not the author, well, maybe he's also an author, but the actor Travis Fimmel, right? The, one of the protagonists uh, in the Viking series. Or the very popular concept of blood eagling, etc. These are all things that are drawn into play when you're playing a game like Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And of course, there are also things there like reenactments of Viking culture that maybe sort of are part of the same type of uh, playfulness that uh, Valhalla is also entering with or cosplaying um, that are playful in themselves, but are not exactly about that game or maybe they're related, but they're sort of outside of it. There's also things, interestingly, that are not play. For example, in Valhalla, you don't really get to do any farming, right? A big part of Viking life would have been farming. Um, not something you really undertake. You actually sort of tell your people and the community to do that. Another thing that you don't get to do in the game, but you get to do outside of it, is go on a history tour. That's very interesting, I think, that particular choice to say, you know, um, the, the actual historical learning of things, the formal learning, that's not play, that's, that's the discovery tour, that's something else. That's actually an entire other product that you can also buy separately, right? And of course, there are things that are actively kept out of play, at least for Ubisoft, I would say, also, I think for most players, I'm hopeful for most players as well, such as, for example, the deep and uh, very troubling connotations of Viking culture with, uh, with the extreme right. So this already shows that what we experience in games 
is uh, quite complex and quite deep and rich and fascinating and impactful. And in that sense, um, I, what I'm uh, going to push a little bit, maybe you've heard this in previous talks already, but what I'm going to push a little bit on is this idea that all of this is representation, that it is representing the past. I think that is maybe part of it in a, in a sort of a superficial sense, but what I actually think is that these games, these past play experience, these playful time machines are experiential artifacts, right? These are things that are made to give us experiences. These are, in that sense, they are quite close to what a time machine would look like if it would consist not only of things that you could uh, experience in the past, but also things that we have experienced and we do value in the present as well, right? So that's really, of course, what this time machine consists of. It consists of the, the making of game makers, of game developers, and a lot of people, and thousands of people in the case of a game like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and of course, a game player or a community of game players, right? And then, of course, we shouldn't forget about the fact that there's also a computer that is running the game. So you have this multi-actor uh, process um, that is giving rise to what we experience there. And that process is built out of past and present bits. That magic circle is, in that sense, fully well, maybe it's a circle, but it's very, it's a leaky circle to think of it. So maybe you're thinking like, okay, that's conceptual wonkery, but uh, how are we going to do anything with this? Because uh, studying representation is in a way, I'm not going to say it's easy because it's not. <laughs> Having studied representation for a long time, for example, in Caribbean archaeology as well, and the ethno history of that. But... Um, Maybe it's one step more difficult to actually understand the experience of yourself that you're having, but particularly, of course, the experiences of others and even more so experiences of others on a massive scale, the way that it's taking place in our current games, right? So obviously this is not something that Playful Time Machines is going to completely solve in the, the five years that it will run. But I did try to at least put it in a, in a way that it can sort of strategically be taken down and that you can sort of start to carve up some of the immense work uh, that is part of that into different sub-projects, different specialists that carry out different works. So, for example, in this upcoming uh, Playful Time Machine project, there will be a PhD position that is focused completely on the design of these things, right? On the mechanics of them. And if you're interested in particular, I won't talk too much about what is actually in those PhD projects because I will talk mostly about work that I've already have a little bit of experience with. You can actually go right now uh, to playfultimemachines.com. You can lead the whole... Uh, well, as, as much of a description as I'm going to give to people that uh, would want to start this particular uh, PhD project, right? But focusing on the design, and particularly I think it's important to focus on design in a way that we get, draw lessons from that at the intersection of heritage and history, um, in a way, in a framework that is actually shareable uh, and descriptive. So um, I'm as a, at the Center for Digital Humanities, and one of the things within the digital humanities and within information science that you use for that is an ontology, a formal ontology, a formal description of actually those game mechanics. This is one thing that uh, that could actually be made by the particular PhD project. Then there's the experience, the idea of play and action. So um, the good news actually that in terms of methodologies, there's a lot of things that we can actually draw from, from game design or from game user research. So that's actually something that I'm proposing to do in this particular part of the project is to do game user research. So basically see how players deal with things while playing, particularly focused on aspects of the past. So oftentimes game user research is for, you know, engagement, fun, etc. This will be game user research based on past play experiences. And then that's what I'll end up talking most about now. There's the value. So the things, the aesthetics and the, the norms that we're bringing into our experiences or we bring into our play and action ourselves. Of course, there's going to be a bunch of games that we're going to be uh, testing that on. And uh, based on previous study, I've sort of made a, a, a rough categorization or in fact, not a rough categorization, three families of games that we'll be working with. And within those three family of games, strategy games, adventure games, and shooter games, we're going to look at um, nine case studies. And within those, you can actually see on screen what those case studies are. There's going to be some to be decided because, of course, um, the uh, gaming industry moves very fast. And we also want to have the chance to actually study new games as well, or new work games at least. And you can also see that maybe you'll notice that what I uh, consciously try to do, I try to, at least in the cases that were already pre-selected, try to strike a balance between 
triple A titles and indie titles. So I don't know. Some I don't exactly know what you've already heard, but of course, it's a big. There can be a big difference in terms of how games are made, in particular, but also in and how in what they actually try to do between the uh, major entertainment industry that is video games uh, and the publishing houses attached to that, and the more craft-based, still very industrial and 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 intensive uh, nature of indie game making. All right. Um, as I said, what I'm going to focus most on is on the subproject that I'll actually be doing as part of this. So that's a subproject that takes in game studies and heritage studies and mixes that in with DH tools as well as, uh, I guess, um, ethnographic tools as well, right? So we'll be doing, uh, we'll be doing, or I'll be doing very much a close reading of games and paratext, which is a, a fairly standard uh, thing to do. I'll do it. Um, also in conjunction with the close reading of games uh, by others, so the playing of games by others, and, um, and also taking an ethnographic or autoethnographic approach to that, more on that in a bit. And I'll combine that with um, research at scale, so distance reading, computation, computationally aided research of games and, and also particularly of paratext, so these large um, uh, blobs and <laughs> things of texts that are fora uh, twitter etc that is um floating around all of these games a particularly uh, a particular example i will give in a moment and all of that will hopefully lead that's the idea anyway to comprehensive understanding of values shaping past play experiences as i already said let me uh, briefly, I don't want to sort of keep things, this is what we will do. So also, this will be a bit more methodologically focused in the sense of this is what I have already been doing. I have, I'm familiar with these particular methods. I've already carried out something. And one thing that I thought I've had enormous use out of is uh, out of autoethnography. So autoethnography is an approach to research and writing that seeks to describe and systematically analyze personal experience in order to understand cultural experience. Maybe this is something you're already doing when you're playing games, right? I think the answer is probably yes. Um, the good thing about autoethnography is that it's actually uh, a larger field. So it's not just autoethnography of games, there's autoethnography of all sorts of personal experiences in order to understand cultural experiences. So there's this larger framework that you get to use with. You can actually sort of have methodological handholds here. So in practice, what this looks like, when you game you have a lot of experiences right you have you're experiencing continuously and throughout the game uh, but there's those experiences that actually sort of stick with you and i'm particularly interested in those experiences that stick with you um, that sort of gave you larger insights or a larger understanding of how the past works within games or how we experience the past in games so when you sort of and it's it one part of autographic research is keeping meticulous notes and making sure that you uh, keep keep take stock of the things that you're actually uh, experiencing but at the same time it's a sort of a reflective memory uh, understanding your own memory researching uh, and then zeroing in on a particular experience that you think can evoke uh, an understanding of that thing that you've experienced in a larger sense to understand it as a cultural experience. So you'll do that in the form of a vignette. And at the end of this section, there will be an example of such a vignette. And after you've created such a vignette, so a very evocative description of that experience, that's when you can move to the analysis. So this is what this experience meant for me. I hope, I hope for therefore that you can also understand how this you, how should, you, you should place this as a cultural experience. And then you can put that in a, in, in a paper that is partly auto ethnographical, for example. So um, the what I'll be doing at the end of this section, auto ethnography of, is of the Minecraft project, which is a project of the Value Foundation. It's something that I didn't run by myself. I simply could not have. Um, it's uh, the Value Foundation. Won't talk too much about it here, but it's a, um, uh, it's a very nice group. I, we, we're nominally a foundation because you have to have a name like that. You have to be a stichting in Dutch if you want to be a legal organization like that. But we're more like a collective of museologists, historians, archaeologists, heritage studies people, and also people that uh, are not uh, at all in any of the particular uh, fields that study the past. And But one of the things that we've done, and I think one of the funnest and uh, I think on a personal level, most rewarding things that we've done is the whole Minecraft. I'm in a German audience, so I guess you get the joke behind the pun behind Romaincraft, that's good. In English, you always have to explain it. But um, 
Well, well Minecraft uh, basically was uh, an interactive, playful, and creative uh, reconstruction uh, for an audience of all ages, obviously because of Minecraft, uh, mostly kids, of the Roman Limes, so the Roman border area in the Netherlands. And in contrast to Germany, where you're quite lucky to have quite a bit of that Roman border area still above ground, in the Netherlands that's not the case. So a lot of it um, that we know of it, we know simply through historical sources partly, but archaeology as well, and a lot of it is simply not visible in our current landscape. So that was part of a reason to try and do something with that, to make this visible, to make this interactive through uh, Minecraft. So we uh, basically went to uh, 14 uh, uh, galleries, libraries, museums, and, uh, and other places in the provinces of South Holland, Gelderland, and Limburg, and we had about 500 builders collectively working on this. And of course, when these people come in, these kids come in, they bring their parents, their grandparents, their friends as well, their older friends. And uh, you also get to talk with these people about Roman heritage and also, also about Minecraft example, for example. So what it would look like, and there's gonna be a moving, very poppy with a um, uh, video of that later with very poppy uh, music. Uh, but this is what something like that would have looked like. So we just bring a bunch of PCs. In this case, we were set up in the lo a temporary exhibit of a local artist who wasn't very happy when he visited the next day after all these, you know, <laughs> Minecraft playing kids around there. Uh, we'd have uh, a big build station, we called it, where one of us would always be sitting and building something. And then we just have people come in, uh, sometimes up to 100 people a day even, uh, and um, and just build things with us. Uh, and whatever they would want to build, or they could also uh, take inspiration booklets um, showing all sorts of uh, reconstructions um, uh, or, or imagery of uh, Roman architecture in the Netherlands or sometimes Germany or sometimes other places and use that uh, as, a, as a way to, you know, make what they think the Roman past would have looked like in this particular region. And we also, um, after the first couple of sessions, we saw that that was maybe a bit too creative, uh, too much creativity for people because there's just a huge chunk of people and that's a very interesting thing that I learned while running this project. Um, that just wants to build exactly the way that it was, right? They don't want to use their own creativity or ingenuity. They just want to say, tell me what archaeologists have found, and that's what I want to build. So what we also did at some point, for the, especially for the larger buildings, that would be quite cool to actually see reconstructed, we made floor plans that people can then sort of uh, copy over. And this is what it uh, looked like in practice already. Apologies for the music, but uh, it's uh, an edited uh, video from um, uh, um, actually a heritage festival that we were part of. So that's just to give you an impression of what was going on there. And at the end, we would be um, ending up, for example, with uh, things like this, where a bunch of the buildings would be uh, built in conjunction or at least in consultation with us. Uh, so this is the Roman fort of Matilo, which is just uh, out. Well, actually, it's inside of Leiden on the actual Limes, uh, but completely below ground. Very few of it has been archaeologically excavated. So what you're seeing here is basically um, uh, you know, an experience based on historical uh, imagination and a building experience by that. And you can already see tiny bits of that. For example, in the uh, corner over here, you can, see, you can see a Roman tree house, a watchtower tree house. And all the way in the back, you can see the very first beginnings of what would be, uh, you know, the, the Vicus, the, the uh, settlement next to the fort, which actually had a large amount of classical temples and all sorts of things that we know weren't there, but that people thought were important to actually put in such a vicinity. And you can also see an, an example of this over here. This is the, the commander's uh, house, way too nice for what we know for sure will, will have been in that particular, for example, building stone in that particular place. And a more important, well, not importantly, but what really drew my attention was while playing, there were all sorts of um, interactions going on 
from the present with the past. So um, this is extensively, I uh, described this extensively in the, the book History in Games, Contingency of an Authentic Past, edited by Martin Lorber and Felix Zimmermann, in which I have a chapter called Toying with History. And one of the things, for example, that would happen was um, in Matilo, this is the same fort that you're looking at right now, people would come in and, or well, one person in particular in this case, would come in and just spawn polar bears all over the fort. And other kids, kids would, or sometimes even parents would get upset and say like, hey, there's a kid there running around spawning polar bears. That's not right, is it? And, you know, we, we had a sort of a policy that we wouldn't just, unless it was absolutely offensive, we wouldn't destroy things that people built. So we would also not destroy the polar bears. And that then led to a discussion like, so why did you put polar bears there? And the example here was, well, because they shouldn't be there, right? So you get this particular playing with the past um, that people understand full well what is actually there, but they sort of want to play against it. And another example, and this is the vignette that I was promising, is this one. I'll just read it out. It's a, basically an experience that I had together with one of her participants, a young girl, in which a, a beach house took on the Roman historian Tacitus. So here it goes. The Romans did not really like to come here at all, I say. In fact, one of them, Tacitus, wrote, This is a land that is cheerless to everyone who views it, except for someone who was born there. The young girl sitting next to me at the computer does not agree. That guy clearly never visited Katwijk during the summer, she fumes. She's right, of course. Tacitus never visited Katwijk, a little-known place at the literal end of the road in 150 AD. But now, a town popular for its beaches and also the home of this girl. These Romans just did not know how to have fun, she replies. But I'll build them something that shows them how fun this place can be. She asks to be teleported from the fort we are building to the coast. Fifteen minutes later, she has built a lovely little hut right there on the beach. That's the little hut. So um, this is one example of some, some uh, an experience I had past playing that really, to me, was an epiphany, right? Because I actually was quoting Tacitus to these little kids and probably they were just half listening to me when I was doing that. Um, but this, this particular girl had the, well, basically she said, well, he got that wrong. And you know what? I actually think Tacitus got that wrong. I think probably there were Romans visiting the Netherlands that had a great time here. Maybe they didn't exactly build beach houses, but they were probably having a much more balanced understanding than of the landscape of um, what is now the Netherlands, its culture, its people, its, its, its environment, then shines true in most of the writings that are actually coming through to us through history. Right. So this to me was an example of uh, a, a moment that I had an epiphany about how the past actually, maybe actually would have worked, but also at least works in the present. So these types of experience, I think we're continuously having, and I think it's immensely when we're playing with the past in video games, when we're having the, when we're entering our playful time machines, right? And they may not always be true in a historical sense of this actually happened, but they're still very, I think, um, as bits and bobs of knowledge or understandings of the past, they're very valuable. And it's these types of insights and experiences that I want to tap into with, with this particular project. Also at scale, and of course that we'll never get to the exact f uh, fine detailed uh, uh, of, of uh, an autographic uh, ex uh, element, but here uh, you can also do this at a large scale uh, in the sense of sort of understanding what people were are feeling about a certain past so this will be uh, an episode that for some of you you may remember but uh, around the time of the announcement of uh, battlefield 5 a game set in world war ii we will have a pretty a graphic um, um bit of the trailer in a moment so already uh, be warned that if you don't like graphic violence there will be some of here including some explosions and shooting um but this trailer that we're going to be seeing led to a very interesting headline, I think, that Reddit, Reddit's Battlefield 5 community had banned historic, historical accuracy arguments on its subreddit. So, as I said, here's the trailer. So just a, a small bit of it, because it's, as I said, pretty graphic and explosive. Um, what was uh, happening in this trailer, basically they were mimicking 
what it's like to be in a Battlefield 5 multiplayer match, right? And if you're tuned into, even a little bit tuned into World War II history or military technology, you would see all sorts of things that you would recognize. For example, the parachutes at a certain moment, there's a V2 um, crashing into uh, the playground, quote unquote, into the battlefield. Um, but there's also all sorts of things that these people picked up on that they said, hey, should this even be here? There was face paint on the models there. Some of the models were wearing um, prosthetics. And of course, uh, there's the traditional British weapon of war, the cricket bat. So there were all sorts of things going on there that, um, in fact, this battlefield subreddit reacted to quite vehemently, quite furiously. So uh, if you do a close read, so you read through these particular subreddits, um, you would read things like, don't break my neck now, but my logic is DICE, the developers, are making their own spin on World War II. They can do what they want with their game and are under no obligation to follow historical authenticity to the fullest. If they market it as a World War II shooter, then yes, historical accuracy is a must is a part of is very much part of immersion because it's a topic people are familiar with. To uh, more uh, more um, well uh, bold things like this is not an effing history lesson. To uh, quite detailed historical analyses of that time, right? So for example, about the prosthetics that you would see. So wire and pulley prosthetics could be adjusted to certain angles and could actually be used exactly like in the trailer, one Reddit user says. Another Reddit user focuses on the role of American black soldiers in war or the role of uh, women, spoilers, that will return in a moment in, in the front as well. To quite extensive, I learned quite a bit reading through this particular subreddit, uh, discussions of particular, in this case, uh, um, individuals, in this case, Nancy Grace Augusta Wake, who was a secret agent during the Second World War. All of that sort of comes crashing down on June the 14th when the moderator says, we're done, it's over, new rule, no more about historical accuracy, it's a game, not a history book. Violations will have consequences. So if you sort of chart that at, all the way at the end of this particular episode, um, there was there was continuous sort of back and forth as well with the developers. And they, they were in the end promised to dial back some of the crazier character customizations and actually promising authentic gear. One of the things that was on the rise on Twitter at the, at the moment was not my battlefield. This is not the battlefield that I want to fight on. So what I did, I distant read this particular subreddit battlefield. Uh, I collected uh, all the comments from uh, the subreddit battlefield uh, from May 1, 2018 to June 30, 2018. And you can already understand that this is a huge amount of comics. It's not exactly big data, but it's still uh, comments that I wouldn't really care to read through and analyze all of my, my and them myself. So 270,619 comments. Then I, I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but then I uh, made sure that all of these comments were uh, cut up into tokens and lemmas uh, using a particular Python um, uh, NLTK package, particularly modified for Reddit text. And then I looked at the relative word frequency distribution per day for a list of target words having to do with history and authenticity and things like that. So relative word frequency means how often does this word occur vis-a-vis -vis all other words on that particular moment in time. So this is what that looks like. Uh, as you can see, uh, the Battlefield subreddit is not very concerned at all with history in uh, the days leading up to uh, that particular uh, trailer. And then boom, we have the trailer. It spikes up history as a word group. So this is historical his, um, and all sorts of ways that history is also spelled wrong. Bumps up and is actively being uh, discussed uh, until this particular Reddit uh, uh, com uh, moderator says, we're not doing this anymore. And then you can even see it's still much more intense than before. However, if you offset this to other, um, all of a sudden, huge increases in relative word frequencies, you can actually also see that, I'm not going to say that every single historical argument that was had here was in bad faith, but there was also definitely something on going on at the same time. In particular, the biggest responses and the most, uh, well, in one way, violent reaction uh, was actually against the inclusion of female character models in the multiplayer game and you can actually see that this has the exact same trajectory but even more pronounced right so not my battlefield was not exactly about historical accuracy but it was very much about the presence of women in history and in the game and you know you can sort of read through that as well with gamergate glasses right is a idea of who is actually supposed to be 
playing these games and who do we get to play as and who actually gets to be part of this community as well so you really get to see that nicely mimicked at this large scale of this entire subreddit vehemently discussing this so this is another aspect of the work that i'll be doing in here to really look at these big discussions that we're having big in not in terms of always of importance but at least big in terms of how many people are participating in it and trying to chart them um as a funny way to end this particular story we actually try to do our survey that i spoke about all the way in the beginning of this talk on this battlefield subreddit as well we actually got banned for it this is a couple of years uh, after that uh, particular episode took place and we were banned or or, or post was um uh, removed uh, to because it was low effort content well i was of course very upset because this was a very you know it was a, a real a real survey not low effort content at all but it was apparently designed to rile up the subreddit so that's very interesting to see how politics like this can also impact your own research strategies as well and your research practice so to give you the start of some answers and i've been uh, doing well at uh, we still have some time for uh, for questions and, uh, and, and answers after but i've been filling up this slot as promised lucas um so what happens in our playful time machines right i think what happens is a complex cultural experience not necessarily a representation to me uh, representation is part of of course what is going on here but it feels representation feels a bit too shallow because these things are in a sense experienced by people they're felt quite literally they're part of their for lack of a better word part of their world right what is happening in these playful time machines they're taking that back so they're taking these bits and bobs and pieces of the reconstructed past back into their own understanding of the present and de facto also the future and in that sense what it's a very i think it's an absolutely fascinating process to sort of chart how interactively design experience and values sort of get mixed into the and this of course is a these design experience values they hide a lot of different actions that you can do in games and a lot of different feelings that you can have and all sorts of different uh, game design strategies and tools etc and also of course a lot of different people because this is very much an interactor process so at large scales taking place and one answer to this as well what happens is it's magic right? uh, we know something is happening uh, but we don't know exactly yet and that's of course what this project and i would say also the larger field of archaeo gaming historical game studies game studies a game user research focused on games set in the past etc uh, is really about right to understand what takes place in these games and also because this is a leaky magic circle what takes place outside of it and then what is the impact we also don't know exactly yet we know that the impact is large both in a quantitative sense it's very popular these games so uh, lots of people are having these experiences and also that uh, we have a good understanding that qualitatively speaking so in terms of what people experience on their own personal level it's also going to be large right if those surveys are to be believed that you can for example change your whole viewpoint on a historical event by playing through a game and then there's another part here that um i think there's a real call as you can see the the heated nature of some of these debates and also how they con directly connect to issues of our time that we want to do a bit more than reflect on this right we actually want to play as scholars i think a positive part in these past present politics based on the video games that we know love and are also community members of right so in that sense uh, there's a real question here of how can we contribute and i don't think that's me me only right that's also Lucas, it's also people uh, uh, in the other historical game studies, uh, scholars in Germany, I think the Archeo gamers, etc. but also students that are interested in this, right? Uh, because uh, you're not in this course for nothing or you're not, didn't come by signing up through Eventbrite for nothing. You actually are pretty interested in the knowledge behind what is going on here. And I think one of the things that simply helps is to talk uh, about that knowledge and that knowledge both is the knowledge of games and how they function, but also the knowledge of the past that you uh, have. Um, with people that are interested in it uh, and that can be little kids in minecraft or their parents or it can be people you can try to reason or talk with people on subreddits or you know, something we also do quite often is uh, live streaming and uh, chatting with people that just pop by our live streams on twitch right and what we want to do there is really hammer home the fact that knowledge in itself and a deeper understanding of the past in itself is fun right it's part and many people that play historical games or games set in the past also intuitively understand that, that understanding and knowing what's going on in that past is actually also part of the fun of playing a game like that 
In that sense, we do want to play beyond our own experiences. We don't want to be the critic in uh, the ivory tower chamber sort of hammering home, this is what I think about this game. No, we want to understand that our own experiences are just one tiny piece of this very, very big puzzle. And in the end, I think this is also a call to play more, particularly within our academic institutions uh, and maybe our professional lives later, because that's another whole other talk. But culturally, historically, we've had this very complex relationship, um, uh, antithetical relationship with fun and games as well. So uh, with that uh, last call in mind, I just wanted to uh, offer you this particular option. This is not a game for the lighthearted. Uh, this War of Mine is a historical game um, that is based on uh, the accounts of uh, the survivors, particularly inner city um, combat survivors uh, of uh, uh, the war in Yugoslavia, made by a Polish studio, 11-bit studios. And as part of uh, the war effort, or in fact the support effort for Ukraine, uh, they sold keys to this game, um, that, and every proceed, and all the proceeds of that would be granted to the Ukrainian Red Cross. The Value Foundation has uh, bought 100 keys, they're still not gone, so we happily give them away. If you go to tinyurl.com slash cdhi-keys, um, you will find uh, a super small survey which basically says, Give us your email, please, and we will get back to you. This may take a little while. They won't be there tomorrow. We have to manually send these keys out. Um, and we will gladly, as long as there are keys available, um, support, uh, give, you, give you a key for this war of mine. Because it's a good example of one of these indie games that has very interesting, important, um, and not always uh, positive in the sense of always working well, and also definitely not positive in the sense of making you feel uh, like you had fun. Uh, games, but it's a uh, very worthwhile there to check out. So that's all I had to share for you today. Um, I've filled up a good 40 minutes, I think, Lucas. So um, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm happily, I'm happy to share it again if there's uh, questions that lead to particular slides later. But uh, I think we maybe want to open things up a bit. Wow! Thank you so much uh, for this uh, extensive presentation and the insights into all your work. It's really impressive and. Uh, Thank you. I think not only today, but also tomorrow in the seminar, we will have a lot to talk about. And uh, yes, also the, the um, methodological issues, really, really interesting also for us in the, in the seminar. So thank you very much. I will stop uh, recording now.